Mold is part of our ecosystem. Same thing with bacteria, same thing with viruses. We can't just get rid of them completely, right? It, it's just, it's not possible. Um, when you look at it from that perspective, the goal is not zero. The goal is under control. We want to limit the abundancy. You know, do you have to have your house hospital grade air quality to have a good quality of life? No, but you do have to have it so that it's more in line with what's considered normal, which what's considered normal, normal is basically an average of what exists, right? And that's, that's how we quantify what normal means. But as we start to look at homes, we want to see did this, this is home 10 times higher than normal, a hundred times higher than normal, a thousand times higher than normal. And what you'll notice is every home is going to be different. They're going to have different species that are abnormal, different, uh, you know, quantities, of course, it's going to range. You may see some visible signs, you may not, Right. So it does make it challenging. I think that's why the screening is the best tool because, you know, I've walked into celebrities' homes that were pristine. You would have never guessed, right, that there was any mold. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter how, how clean the home is, how nice the home is. If there is water, there will be trouble. Right. And so that's kind of how we have to look at it. So screening is the best way because even if there's mold behind a wall or bacteria behind a wall, it's going to produce particles. It's going to get into the living environment and settle where our dust settles. So we're going to pick up stuff that we can't otherwise see. Michael, welcome to the Root Cause Medicine podcast. I am really excited to talk to you today. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. We are going to dive into mold, especially on mold in the home. Um, we've already had Dr. Jill Krista on to talk about mold in the body, but the next logical question everybody has is, well, how do I know if it's where I live, if it's in my business, everyone's going back to work or, you know, thinking about going back to work. I feel worse at work. I feel better at work. I feel worse at home. I feel better at home. And so you're the perfect person. I'm just going to pick your brain about all these things, all these questions that everybody's been submitting. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, uh, I'm, I'm pretty appreciative of, you know, being here and trying to give people good information. Um, inhalation is the greatest route of exposure that we have. So it's really important to look at our environment. I think it's something that we often don't think about much. So, you know, creating that awareness and letting people know that their environment um, can be something that's affecting them, I think is really important because a lot of times people find out way later and then they have to work 10 times harder to kind of, you know, work through that process. So a hundred percent. And, and before, okay, before we get going though, for those who don't know who you are, will you give them a little background into you, your background, your company, your new company, your new branding? Yeah. Your book? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my name is Michael Rabino. For those that don't know me, I am a 10 uh, year expert in mold remediation. Um, I am certified by the ACAC as a uh, certified microbial uh, council certified microbial remediation supervisor, which requires a minimum of 10 years of experience. I'm a contributor, uh, sp sponsor, and speaker for the Indoor Air Quality Association. Um, been really uh, heavily grounded into figuring out how to remediate homes, specifically for people that are going through, you know, uh, immune deficiencies, immunocompromised, autoimmune disease and disorders. Uh, you know, people that really need a, a better standard of care inside their home. Uh, as respects to air quality. So that has been kind of my journey, which led me to write a book called The Mold Medic, An Expert's Guide on Mold Removal, which you can see right behind me. Um, I started a company in 2017 called All American Restoration, which has now been rebranded to Home Cleanse. And mainly it's just because uh, we're looking to go global, creating products for people that really need uh, a new, new new sets of technology available. And so Home Cleanse is a little bit more footing, uh, fitting to you know, go on a global stage like that. So uh, really excited to be here and give people great information. And uh, that's a little bit about me. Which is a perfect segue to our first question. How would somebody listening to this even suspect that they have mold in their house? If you're talking to somebody at a party when, and they're talking about either their symptoms or their house or something that happened, what makes you think, well, that's, that's mold. You should get checked for mold. You should probably get that tested for mold. What pops to mind? So let's talk about the, what used to be and what needs to be. So ah. what used to be the gold standard is an air test. People would just come in your house, set up this little pump looking machine inside your, you know, typically the center of a room. They would uh, draw a sample for a few minutes. Um, and then that sample would go to a lab to be analyzed. 
And basically how it works is it's microscopy. So they're looking under a microscope and they're looking for mold and they're counting, you know, approximately how many spores they found um, inside that sample. Uh, the problem with this is, and I think you're going to talk to Brian Carr uh, coming up soon. Um, Brian did a study where he showed that an air sample three feet away from a major source completely missed the source. So when you're in the center of a room, you know, which could be 10, 15 feet away from a potential source, you know, obviously depending on the size of the room, but you're not going to pick it up, right? It's going to appear normal. So that gold standard really needs to go away. Um, there is obviously a use for air testing. I think it's part of the process and helping find sources, but it's got to be done carefully. Air testing really isn't a great screen, right? And so to kind of put things into perspective, you go to a doctor, you're not feeling well, you're they're typically going to screen you. They're going to try to pinpoint, they're going to look for abnormalities on a larger scale, trying to pinpoint smaller things that, that could really be the problem, right? So we want to look at the home the same way. The best way to screen is actually by testing the dust. Hmm. There's a ton of technologies out there. Um, hopefully by the time this episode comes out, we'll, we'll have packaged something together for you guys called the dust test. But basically, you know, we've heard of MSQ PCR uh, technology, which everyone knows it as ERMI. Um, we're trying to get away from ERMI because ERMI actually means the score. And what we're trying to talk about is a technology behind, you know, obtaining that score, which I think is a lot more, um, it's a lot more scientific, of course, and it's also a lot more valuable when you're looking at it from an expert perspective. And what we're looking for is by screening using, using this technology, we're looking for those abnormalities. Um, particularly, you're going to have 36 different species on that one. Uh, you're going to have uh, different asterisks next to it. Asterisks meaning if it's 10 times higher than normal, 100 times higher than normal, or 1,000 times higher than normal. So you'll have one asterisk for each power of 10. Um, and why we want to look at that is because if there's something is abnormal, it it's typically means that there's a source creating those particles, making it abnormal, right? So we want to look at that. We want to do a screen of the home to really identify if our home is a problem. Because if we go the old way of doing things by just taking a couple air samples randomly in the house, we're, we're a lot less likely to find uh, if, if our home is actually a contributor or not. So you you mentioned screening, meaning do you feel everybody listening should probably screen their home for mold or historically what people do is they go, well, I had water damage or, um, we bought a house and did the air test or, um, in our crawl space or our basement, you know, there was a leak. So people tend to say, oh, I saw water. I'm going to test as opposed to, I feel like most of the time you have no idea where the leak is. You don't know where the mold is. If it's, you know, up in the ceiling or behind wall space that you can't get to. So do you feel screening across the board or only when they know of an event? Personally, I would just screen across the board. And, and, you know, and I'm not saying that to try to, you know, sell more tests or anything. I think that proactive is better than reactive. Right. And for most of us, we don't really do anything about it until it becomes a problem. And if we look at that, if we look at it from that perspective, you know, it's not going to better our health. Mm -hmm. So we should be screening homes when we buy them. You live in a home right now and you've never screened it. You should screen it. See if there's anything abnormal, you know, at, at least it provides you peace of mind if everything looks good. But, you know, when you start to see small abnormalities, you may be able to find that source and eradicate it before it becomes this big problem. Because, you know, the issue with water damaged homes is they, one, one simple small problem spreads very rapidly. And it does that through the HVAC mechanical machines because most of us don't have filters that will stop particles that small from passing through that filter. And so mold and bacteria start to grow around that evaporator coil, which basically provides us AC because it's always, a, it's a very wet environment that uh, is perfect for, you know, microbial growth. So when we look at it from that perspective, I think catching problems while they're small before they contaminate the HVAC system and create a big problem for us is probably better in the long run, um, especially considering there's so many unknown and mysterious health issues that can come up with, you know, having a ton of microbial growth in our homes. So I, I think that proactive is the way to go. Um, certainly if you're listening and 
you're like, well, I may have mysterious health issues and I've been to 40 different doctors and they haven't figured it out. Maybe it is my home. Well, the screen would be a perfect uh, starting point for you because that's going to tell you what is in your environment that you are inhaling. Um, everything that's in our dust does recirculate in our home and get inside of our bodies. If you've ever sat on a couch in front of a, a window, right? And that a ray of light peered through and you saw all that junk that's floating around, just remember that that's the stuff that you can see. And microbial is stuff that you can't. It's too small. Our eyes cannot physically see it. So you could compound that times a thousand and that's what you're breathing in. So when you look at it from that perspective, you know, we have to really make sure that our air quality is good. And that doesn't mean just what's in the air, but it means what's in the dust because the dust will become in our air as we open doors, windows, move through the house, et cetera. So really, really important that we kind of dive into this a little bit more thoroughly than we have in the past. And I'm going to ask you about filters in just a bit, but I want to go back and, and touch on how often were you hearing like the pandemic, everybody went home and their symptoms got worse. I'm worse at home or I had to go back to work. And now that I'm back into this, my work building, I'm noticing that my symptoms that were so much better are, are so much worse. Or I've even had people tell me I rented in Airbnb or went to a hotel for vacation. And I realized I, my symptoms got so much better. Um, I thought it was because I was on vacation. Turns out it might actually be my home. Do you hear that a lot? Oh yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, since the pandemic started, I think people started to connect the dots a little more mm -hmm. and started to say, you know what? Um, yeah. All last year before the pandemic, I was at work more, right? I wasn't as home as much. Now that I'm home, I'm seeing my symptoms get worse, right? Mm -hmm. So they're seeing that correlation with more time spent in the home, their health is declining even more rapidly than before, right? So as we look at that, we can really understand that obviously there's a problem inside the home that's creating this environment where that's happening. Um, but people are realizing that more. I think also through COVID, we, a, a, lot of, a lot of society learned what PCR is for the first time, which is uh, you know, obviously a, a form of DNA testing. Uh, specifically in this case, they learned it through COVID for testing for COVID. But now they're understanding that there's a way to use PCR technology for a lot other things, especially with mold and bacteria uh, and, and looking at water damaged homes which is exactly why I think dust testing has really picked up in popularity, uh, which I think is a good thing because if we start to screen our homes, we really start to understand what the impact is. And just through that data too, we're going to learn so much. My hope with this product isn't just to help consumers, but also to help doctors bridge that gap. Understanding, being able to look at patterns of what's going on inside someone's home versus what's going on inside their body could really help us break through that veil and create a lot more validity to, you know, what it is that we're trying to study here. Because as we know, there's, you know, hundreds of different studies on, you know, PubMed and NIH talking about basically how mold and bacteria and water damaged homes can create health issues. But when you, when you dive into it, it's researchers that aren't connecting with doctors that aren't connecting with the scientific community in the field, working on people's homes. And so you kind of miss this whole opportunity to really tie things together better. So I think with, well, I'm hoping with this technology, we can really push for that more um, to try to package this together, looking at mold, bacteria, and mycotoxins, which is kind of the goal right now to do that. You have to kind of go to a few different labs with our product, it's one product, you can get all three, you don't have to, you know, go to a bunch of different labs. And we're, you know, going to be giving the, the same price, if not better than some of the labs will to directly to consumers. So we're trying to make this more accessible. Which after I talked to you on Instagram, uh, we did an Instagram live for those who are listening um, a couple weeks ago. And after we got finished, I said to my husband, as soon as, as soon as we can do this dust test, we're doing this dust test all throughout our house. And then when, after talking to Dr. Jill about just the symptoms um, that are connected to mold and, and mycotoxins, which the list is infinite of what it can worsen. And I'm in the realm of hormones. Um, that's what I do. And I read now, now I'm reading paper after paper where researchers are not afraid to say reproductive issues due to mold mycotoxin exposure, you know, issues with hormones, estrogen issues, ovulation issues, um, pregnancy issues due to mold mycotoxin exposure, however that looks. Whereas, you know, a couple of years ago, they weren't willing to say that. 
so blatantly in papers and now i'm seeing it more and more and uh, even with cortisol cortisol stress response how a person handles a stress response anxiety depression insomnia um now i'm seeing it more and more in papers of like well do you live in a home you know that your your master the main bad bedroom in the bathroom has water damage and maybe you just don't realize it and it's going to affect sleep and rest restoration and energy the next morning and et cetera, et cetera. And those are, I would say common symptoms, whereas, you know, you've talked about that before in, in your book and, and Jill, Dr. Jill talk about everything to autoimmune and, you know, cancer. And I mean, it can be a myriad of things that people are just, as you said, 40 doctors later, they're like, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I, I knew someone who's like, literally muscles were turning to stone, mm. um, you know, through, uh, uh, just, uh, there's a lot of rarities out there. Of course. Uh, one of our clients was, uh, was actually so sick. She had to install a GJ feeding tube, uh, literally to get the nutrients to keep her alive within seven days of moving out of her house. So we could start the work feeding tube is gone. Huh. Um, she was in a wheelchair or bedridden out of the wheelchair, out of the bed, you know, uh, is she perfect at this point? point in time? Probably not, but, uh, that was a couple of months ago now at this point. Um, and I think that she's well on the road to, you know, having a better quality of life today. Um, she's working with, uh, you know, uh, a doctor, right? So she's doing all the steps. It's, I can't do much about the body. I can obviously do about the environment. And, you know, I, I, I never tell people that the environment is going to solve hundred percent of your problems. Cause you still have stuff internally that needs to be removed you still have imbalances. I mean, I think hormonal imbalances that happen through, you know, living in, inside of a water damaged home or building. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we know fully all of the, the different possibilities. Uh, when I look at like kind of our study in the medical based community, I'm obviously not a doctor, but um, I would consider myself a researcher at this point because I do a lot of research, right? And I connect with people and ask a lot of questions. I'm trying to always understand what are we doing here so that I know how to fix things from the home's perspective. Um, when I look at this, this wide array here, I, I honestly don't think that we know everything there is today to, to know mm -hmm. uh, about the different types of effects that being in a water damage building can have. But when we look at 20,000 breaths per day that we take on average, when we look at you know things like oxidative stress and inflammation, all of these foreign particles that enter our body cannot be good for oxidative stress. They can't be good for our liver, uh, you know, our kidneys. Uh, we add, start adding toxins into the mix, right? Because mold can produce certain toxins, bacteria as well. What's that toxic overload look like for us? You know, we talk a lot about mold and mycotoxin exposure in the agricultural industry. For those that, that may not be aware, I mean, the government really is, is you know, in tune with mold and mycotoxin exposure in our food supplies, and there's testing and regulations. How how good are those regulations? I have no idea, but they're at least as talking. They're, they're at least on it, right? As far as we know, this is a problem. But when we look at what's the what's the greatest exposure route on this planet, it's inhalation, right? We learned that through COVID. You know, it you didn't have to clean your grocery packaging before you put it into your freezer, like we all were doing in the beginning, right? We learn that, no, you get this through inhalation. So when we understand that the greatest pathway of exposure is going to be inhalation, and we know that it's a problem for our food supply, why wouldn't it be a problem for our homes, right? And so as you start to connect these dots and you start to understand, you start to see the big picture. Why, why isn't it much more widely known in the communities? Because um, honestly, if, if you want, you know, I'm not, there's no conspiracies here. I just think that we're now learning new information. You know, when I look at it from a remediation perspective, I have probably been the most thorough remediation person to ever come into this industry in the last 10 years. Why is that? Because when other people were saying that there's no way this can make people sick and they're just crazy or they're just difficult clients, I was like, I don't know, this kind of makes a lot of sense. And I started diving into it. So it's not that I think that there's this massive conspiracy. What I honestly think is happening is I think that it's taking some people to really put themselves out there to, to help create this change and to say that this is possible. And here's how we handle that. 
And so over the past, you know, 10 years, I've, I've helped over a thousand families get back into their home, just understanding and looking at it from a different view. And that's a scientific view, knowing that mold is both an organism and a particle. Same thing with bacteria, right? Same thing with viruses. So as we start to understand a little bit more about microbiology, it really starts to make sense. Well, we can't just fog the place or we can't just open up a hole in your wall and spray some bleach and think that that's going to do it because it's alive. Mm -hmm. And then the particles that it produces are not alive until they're met with Earth's life source, which is water. Similar how a plant grows in your yard, it reproduces by seeds. Those seeds fall in the soil, they get wet, and that seed becomes a full-grown plant again. Right there, there is you know germination that happens on this planet, and so as we start to look at this, it starts to make sense why we have never really been able to handle this problem as an entire industry, fifty thousand approximate companies, because we've been looking at it incorrectly. And so when we start to really look at science, we're able to really start to help people, and we're able to start to take it more serious, and we should because the data is there right? This, this is not, we don't want to have a ton of foreign particles in our environment getting into contact with our body. Now our body has to fight 10 times harder to remove them, right? So that, that's, I think that's it in a nutshell of kind of how I started to pivot and started to turn things around. And putting that information out there empowers people to, to take the right action and not, you know, fall victim to some of these people that are saying it's not a big deal or that you can't make you sick or that, you know, this, this chemical will, will solve all your problems. Cause it won't. Is all mold bad. If somebody did do, um, what's known as, you know, the ERMI test and had some mold came up positive, if they eventually do a dust test or can they expect it ever to be zero? No. So mold is part of our ecosystem. Same thing with bacteria, same thing with viruses. We can't just get rid of them completely. Right. It, it's just, it's not possible. Um, when you look at it from that perspective, the goal is not zero. The goal is under control, mm -hmm. right? So when you, if you had a hundred people with COVID inside your house, coughing and sneezing, you're gonna have a lot of virus particles inside your environment and you're very likely to get sick, right? So, and that's same for any flu, cold, anything, right? That's just how we get sick. We, we inhale a lot of these particles, our body, it, it, there's too many for our body it, and we get sick, right? So when we look at it from that perspective, it's just, it's an abundancy. We want to limit the abundancy. You know, do you have to have your house hospital grade air quality to have a good quality of life? No, but you do have to have it so that it's more in line with what's considered normal, which what's considered normal, normal is basically an average of what exists, right? And that's, that's how we quantify what normal means. Um, when we look at normal um, from, from a perspective of MSQ-PCR, we're looking at normal through the EPA's lens, right? Because the EPA did the, the, the largest collection so far of data, um, and we probably will have a much larger collection in the future to be able to share um, to, to get a better sense of what normal really is. But as we start to look at homes, we want to see does this, this is home 10 times higher than normal, 100 times higher than normal, 1,000 times higher than normal. And what you'll notice is every home is going to be different. They're going to have different species that are abnormal, different uh, you know, quantities, of course. It's going to range. You may see some visible signs. You may not, right? So it does make it challenging. I think that's why the screening is the best tool because you know, I've walked into celebrities' homes that were pristine. You would have never guessed right, that there was any mold. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter how, how clean the home is, how nice the home is. If there is water, there will be trouble, right? And so that's kind of how we have to look at it. So screening is the best way because even if there's mold behind a wall or bacteria behind a wall, it's going to produce particles. It's going to get into the living environment and settle where our dust settles. So we're going to pick up stuff that we can't otherwise see when we do that screening. So I think it's very, very valuable to kind of go that route and really take a deeper look than we've ever looked before. One of the things that's always surprised me, and I mostly see this on social media, is I, I don't think people look at their home very much, meaning they don't open cupboards and look into them or, you know, like under the sink or under the bathroom or, or even in their appliances and their Keurig. Um, so it, I, 
I always find it interesting when someone goes, oh my gosh, I was digging around in the depths of my bathroom cabinet and found mold. And, you know, here it could be, or I finally got around to cleaning my Keurig and who knew there was a whole bunch of mold when I took it apart. Where do you tend to see, like what's common for where you tend to see actual mold? I know you can't always see it, but where, if somebody was going to go check out their house, when you're doing the remediation process, what's the most common? And then on the flip side, what are some of those like tricky, rare, you wouldn't suspect places? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. You know, first off, we're all human beings. Um, oh, I'm just busy. as guilty. I'm not judging yeah, anyone. <laughs> I forget. I want to, I want to tell a good story. Um, we, uh, my, my wife and I, and our two kids, we went away. Um, I, I, it was just like three or four days, like a long weekend. Right. And, um, we have a coffee machine and we, you know, make coffee with every morning. And, uh, I come back home, you know, the next day I'm getting ready for work. Like any other morning, I make some coffee. I take a sip of this coffee and I am like, yep, that is a, (laughs) that is mold. So I instantly spit it out in my sink, pour the whole cup out. I open up the machine to see what's going on. Full of mold. We were gone for three days. Opportunistic little bastard. I don't know know who, but I'm going to take the blame for it, right? But so I left coffee grinds, you know, the machine, basically it, it spits out the coffee grinds right into this little tray and every day you're supposed to empty out that tray, wash it out, let it dry. Well, I had forgotten to do that before we left. And so, you know, that, that machine, which is not the cheapest coffee machine is now in the garbage. Why? Because even if I were to clean it thoroughly, knowing how to remediate stuff, to take, it would, I would have to seriously take that thing apart, probably replace rubber gaskets. It's just, it's just not, it's not worth it. Right. Um, if I drank that entire cup of coffee, probably would have had a headache, probably would have felt sick to my stomach, you know, who knows. Right. But at the end of the day, it's, it's human, right? We're human. We make mistakes, we do stuff and there's consequences to our actions. In this case, my consequence was a, a coffee cup full of mold that I almost drank. Um, you know, coffee machines can be pretty problematic, especially exact in that exact scenario. We go away, we forget to clean them. You know, we forget to let them dry properly. You know, we get mold. Uh, front load washing machines is another you know uh, nightmare because you know essentially it has a rubber gasket that keeps the water from spilling out all over your floor every time you wash your clothes. Um, well, that rubber gasket traps moisture too, right? It just never fully dries. Any Anytime you have never fully drying anything within 24 to 48 hours, you're going to grow mold. So we see that a lot. Uh, showers, um, grouts, semi-porous. Most people don't seal their grout. Even if you did, it's going to wear off over time. You're going to have some, some moisture there. And particularly a lot of contractors build showers improperly. You know, I've seen tile on top of drywall, huge no-no, even if it's green, purple, I don't care what color it is. It's moisture resistant, not moisture proof, right? We have to learn learn the difference. Um, you're going to have mold growing on mo- moisture resistant drywall. So there's no doubt about it. Um, and then even if they put cement board, if they don't waterproof that cement board and water gets behind it, right? You're going to have mold growing in the cavity. The amount of showers I've had to rip out in my entire lifetime is, is sad, uh, very sad. And these are, some of them were brand new, you know, just, just remodeled a year ago. So we have to be careful and a little bit more educated on, you know, construction because construction pitfalls lead to a lot of problems for us. Um, We also have attics and crawl spaces, attics and crawl spaces. You know, I can't tell you how many times people are like, but I never go down there. Good. I, I wouldn't go down there either, but air rises. And because our homes are not hermetically sealed, that air is going to bring tiny microbial particles into your environment that you're going to be breathing in. So you have to fix it. Um, Attics too, same thing. Um, Even though air typically rises, depending on where you live in the wintertime, that that actually reverses and air from your attic will push downward into your home. So, you know, you want to... The top and bottom of your home, you always want to have in good condition, whether you go up there or down there or not, because they're going to cross-contaminate into the living environments 
where you are spending time. So I would say, um, you know, I'd, you'd be surprised to see how many addicts have issues. Um, you know, people have told me everything under the sun, like, no, I think that's just lumber yard mold. And it's like, good. Well, you, lumber yard mold is mold, right? It doesn't matter if you got it at the lumber yard or the lumber sat in the soil while they were building the home. It doesn't really matter. Mold is mold, right? And there's different types of mold, over a hundred thousand of them. We only really know much about maybe 40 to 50 of them. So uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, subject to kind of figure out where this is. Um, we've seen bathtubs on top of hardwood floors. So every time you step out of your bathtub onto your hardwood floor, it's just dripping water into the floor and uh, creating an environment where mold will grow underneath that tub. Um, hardwood floors and kitchens, kind of the same thing, spills and my dishwasher leak, but I cleaned it up real quick. It, you know, unfortunately, hardwood floors are pretty difficult. That water passes down. You're going to have water sitting. If you look at, you know, from a perspective of this is the top of the hardwood floor, you're going to have what's called a subfloor underneath it. If water goes down into those cracks and it wets the subfloor underneath it, it's going to take a really long time to dry. And a really long time to dry means a really good opportunity for mold. So we, we have to just kind of be a little bit more mindful. There's a lot of tools and technologies out there that can help dry, um, you know, between two surfaces, but I don't think they're foolproof. And I think you still want to test and verify to be absolutely sure. Um, basements, another thing, anything subgrade, right? You have the potential for uh, what we would consider hydrostatic pressure, um, which is basically the pressure of the water sitting against the foundation um, that forces it through. Uh, for some people, that's active running water where you see puddles in your basement. For others, it, it's considered vapor diffusion, where it basically diffuses through the cement foundation and comes into your home in the form of relative humidity. Meaning if you were to you know, have a relative humidity monitor down there and you noticed it was a rainy day, odds are your basement humidity would probably be a lot higher that day. So we can combat that with things like dehumidification systems. Um, so it's, you know, anything that we, any challenge that we have in a home or building, I think that I always try to end with some good news. There's something you can do about it. You know, uh, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, of, co of course, I've seen it all and I've done it all. So I think at that, from that perspective, I'm going to tell you a lot more horror stories. But the reality of the situation is all of it is, is preventable and controllable. And it's, it's by knowing that mold grows in 24 to 48 hours. So acting fast, right, is key. And knowing that you need to control moisture and humidity, as that's really, if you solve that problem, it's, it's all of the battle, not even just half the battle. So what do you do about leaks? You know, do them quickly. Um, and preventative, you know, preventatively screen your home, make sure that nothing abnormal is popping up. Cause if it is, you know, something's occurring and the faster you act on it, the better you're going to be. I have two funny stories listening to you talk about this, but the first one, um, my husband was retiring from the military and we were transitioning from the army base to the city we we're moving to. So we were temporarily living in my, one of my best, my best friend had a house. She had a rental house and she let us use it in this temporary transition. And it was built in the late 1800s, early 1900s, no late, uh, yeah, I, the early, yeah, 1900s. And uh, which is old for the Pacific Northwest. So it, she said, it's not on great foundation and we're kind of grandfathered in, there's a lot of cracks and because we're in the Pacific Northwest, it rains a lot. So she said, be aware if you have anything in the basement, we have a lot of tables down there, put it up on the tables because it can get kind of wet down there. I was like, all right, we moved in in the spring. It wasn't raining much when we moved in and within very quickly, it started to really rain. And, uh, I apologize for my language, but it was like a goddamn river runs through it down there. I mean, water just poured in through the cracks all across the basement out the other side. And I was like, I could literally blow up a kayak and just float this. Like, <laughs> This is a lot of water. And I thought, well, I was like, oh, I can't live here. There's, there's no way. Um, but at that point, obviously being such an old home on such old foundation, the amount of restoration remediation she'd have to do would have just been astronomical but she just so she just warns people it's a lot of water in the basement when it rains <laughs> but the second story i learned is living at the bottom of a hill my brother-in-law um when i first started dating my husband his my brother-in-law lived 
at the bottom of a very steep hill, also in the Pacific Northwest. And so all the rainwater came down the hill of the neighborhood um, through everyone's backyards right to his house. And he, I believe he had some French drains, but obviously they were getting very overwhelmed very quickly and his backyard would often flood. And it turned out he had a walkout basement and they found that the subfloor was just, was also a lake itself. And they had to rip everything out um, and install a lot to combat the fact that they lived at the bottom of a hill and took on everybody's rainwater through all the rainy season. And it was a good lesson to learn when he said, don't buy a house at the bottom of a hill. And I, <laughs> my husband and I bought this house. The whole, we were like, is it a hill? Are we on a hill? Does anybody's yeah. backyard come down to ours? And no, we don't live on a hill. So we don't live at the bottom of the hill. We are on the top of the hill. Um, but things like that, you would never think of until somebody goes through it, cracks at a basement, um, the age of the home being grandfathered in, they wouldn't really have to do anything from a um, construction updating point of view, or I guess you don't know until you go through it or your friend goes through it or family does. And then you're like, oh, learning experience. Don't live at the bottom of the hill or make sure that your the drains that you have in place are capable of handling Pacific Northwest rain if you live in a rainy place. Yeah, that's great advice. I had a client that didn't live at the bottom of the hill. And unfortunately, she had to spend a, a, quite a pretty penny um, in drainage solutions, right? So basically, you had to drain the water so that if you're, if you're, the water is coming down that hill, it actually goes around the house yeah. and not hitting the house. And so you're talking a lot of grading, sloping to divert the water. The nice thing about water is, it, you know, if you know much about it, it follows the path of least resistance. So you just, you just have to divert it so that, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the resistance is far too great to get to the house. You just divert it away. Uh, you know, and I think that's, that's really the key with water is um, if you buy a, a house at the bottom of the hill and you're just getting smacked with water, you know, it's at some point or, or sooner than rather than later, you know, that path of least resistance is going to be in your house. Right. So <laughs> you have to kind of, you have to kind of think with that and try to figure out what's the best path here. And, you know, that can, that's going to require engineers that, you know, can, that know the products, know the ways of, of, you know, diverting that water, how to do it safely and effectively and helping out with that. But, you know, yeah, you, you bring up a really good point. You know, you gotta, you gotta kind of be more mindful. Um, I love that story of the, the, the river in the basement. Essentially. <laughs> the river runs through uh, it. I so yeah, if you're listening and your house is like that, you want to make sure that it's not like that, you know, yeah. and, and again, that could require engineering and waterproofing and things like that. But, you know, letting that water just come through your basement and, you know, kayak out of it, probably not the best way to have a, a, a good environment that's, uh, you know, doesn't have microbial growth because you're, you're very likely to have that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it was definitely a shock. And I know a lot of homes, especially on the East coast are quite old, you know, for America. So they, when they were built, they didn't, they didn't have, but the, while they might've been built well and, and maybe tight above down below, if they even had any kind of basement or crawl space or, you know, place yeah, for coal, some, right? Like the little so, yeah. wizard of Oz spaces. <laughs> um, it's, it's not great. Some homes literally have what's called rock foundation, mm -hmm. especially like in the Northeast where they literally just took rocks and mortar and put it all together and it was a uh, home. And so as that mortar deteriorates, right, not only is there some structural things that can happen, but your, you know, water coming in is, uh, you could pretty much bet on it, right? So mm -hmm. you have to definitely figure out how to divert that water away so that you don't have all that water sitting there and you know, sometimes it's going to require, you know, good drainage um, system. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about filters. Um, one, going back to the beginning, you've mentioned HVAC filters probably aren't often used to combat some of these particles. Is it possible for us non-hospital grade folks to get to buy filters? What do we look for when we need to replace the filter in our HVAC system at our house? Yeah, it's a good question. MERV 16 MERV is 16. kind of the, it's, it's, so uh, every every filter has a MERV rating, essentially, um, and it's an efficiency rating. So it tells you how efficient that filter is, and you can kind of trace that efficiency down to how small of a particle will it stop from coming in. 
Uh, MERV-16 technology is going to get down to the smallest particle possible um, at this current stage. The challenge with HVAC is usually the thicker the filter, the more uh, it restricts the airflow, which mm. can cause a whole host of problems. So when you look at that challenge, you need something that has different chambers that allows the air to pass through and stops different particle sizes through each chamber, essentially allowing for air to not be as restricted so you don't have this what's called pressure drop. So there's uh, a, a ton of great products that have come out in the marketplace that are like MERV 16 filters with a MERV 8 pressure drop, hmm. which is very ideal. That's, that's the type of stuff that you're, that you're looking for. How small of a particle can it remove? And if you think going to Home Depot and buying like the allergy filter and that aisle is going to cut it, I promise you, it, it unfortunately will not. Um, mold is, is typically between two and four microns in size. Very, very small stuff. A lot of those filters are, are, are not going to get close to that. Um, if you're lucky, you'll find a good uh, entry-level filter that may get down to three microns. So you'll capture some, but definitely not all. And so, you know, you want to definitely try to do as best as you can on that filter because, you know, believe me, as particles pass through and get to that coil, the entire HVAC system becomes like a mold factory. And now that's producing particles too. And that's, of course, traveling through all the rooms in our house. So it becomes quite a big challenge. Um, of course, again, you know, not all doom and gloom. If you don't have a good filter and you suspect mold in your HVAC, you can remediate it. Uh, and obviously you can test and make sure that it was remediated properly. There's definitely something you can do about it. But I think if you, unless you want to clean that thing every month, you're going to have to figure out a way to start preventing stuff from getting in there. One of my friends who was in construction would talk about, you know, everyone advertises about duct cleaning. You know, they, they, blow out mm -hmm. your ducts and he was like but a lot of the ducts were installed poorly quickly incorrectly they weren't um sealed well together so he was showing me of when do like a duct in a crawl space and it had big gaps where you know two ducts come came together so he said now you do the duct cleaning but you just pull up all the dust and dirt from the crawl space in through these gaps in the ducts that run through the crawl space put them right back into your duct and then push them out through the rest of your house. And so he's, he was saying the intention and his, you know, he understands, but at the same time, it's going back to the root cause, hence the name of the podcast of, you know, you even have to look at things like that is, was your HVAC even installed correctly? Or is it just picking up is the air is pushing through dust and mold and dirt from the attic and the crawl space, et cetera. Do you see that as well? Oh yeah. I mean, it's a big problem. Um, you have between HVAC getting installed incorrectly, um, <laughs> between, you know, animals and stuff getting in the attic and Ugh. chewing holes through ducts happens all the time. All the time. You know, it does create that environment where, yeah, you clean the ducts, but it's coming right back in. Right. And so yeah. I think it's, you know, when you're going through duct cleaning, somebody, the person cleaning the ducts obviously should be notifying you that, Hey, there are some issues. Can we replace some of these ducts? Because, you know, we can clean them, but you're just going to have a problem again. You know, the, the HVAC industry, um, the, the kind of their, their rule of thumb is as long as it's 97% sealed, this is a great job. And so I, I always find it interesting because I feel like if we don't strive for perfection, we don't get close to it. So if 97% is what we're striving for, right? I'm just, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. What is it actually, right? We have a lot of duct leakage and duct leakage creates all kinds of problems between condensation, right? I, I can't tell you how many homes I've been to where they're like, I have some mold around my vent. What's happening? I'm like, well, you're, you're either the duct is loose and you have air exchange creating condensation or that metal box that your vent sits in uh, we've all seen our vents. They have like two screws on either side that actually screws into a metal box behind the drywall. And if that box isn't insulated properly, that thing is going to sweat because you're going to have cold air blowing through it and hot attic air, wherever, you know, whatever that air temperature is of whatever wall cavity or ceiling cavity it is typically is going to create condensation. So I can't tell you how many times that, you know, I'm looking at someone's home and I'm like, okay, well, we have to cut, we don't only have to cut that open and remove that mold, but we also 
have to figure out what's happening up there that's creating that condensation because otherwise it's gonna, you're, you're going to call me again in three months, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, duct work is a big part of the problem. Um, temperature differentials, condensation, duct leaking, um, you know, is going to provide a, a pretty well host of problems between moisture and excess dust and stuff coming into our duct that we don't want. So, right. Um, yeah. Before I ask you about remediation, though, I have to ask air filters, like home air filters. A lot of people have a just a filter, right? Just sitting up or a, something on their counter or something in their bedroom. Do those do any good? So like air purifiers? Yeah. Sorry. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. Air purifier. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's good. Just kind of like we purify our water, purifying our air, I think is great. Um, you know, I think it depends on what one you have, just kind of like everything else in this world, right? You know, you're going to have good air purifiers. You're going to have great air purifiers. You're probably going to have some ones that are, you know, probably not worth the the money you spend. But I think, you know, from, from a perspective of, again, looking at that filtration, how small of a particle can this air purifier remove? Um, And when we look at it from that perspective, I think it's going to help us with our overall plan here of trying to reduce the amount of particles we're breathing in. Um, but you know, you, you may want one in every room or yeah, every time you have a potential to close your door, right. And you don't have an air purifier in there. You just got to remember, it's not purifying that air. So, you know, if you're going to get one, they may, you know, one or two, make sure you put in places you spend the most time in, um, and another added bonus to those, because if you're like me and you hate cleaning, but you know how important cleaning is, uh, you know, you're going to notice that. When you use an air purifier and it's removing those particles that are in the air, it's going to be a lot less dust being created in the process to clean. So um, that's a really nice thing because a lot of stuff does settle exactly where our dust settles. And that's why we, you know, utilize our dust to kind of screen our homes, but less dust uh, provides a lot of added benefits, not only to our health, but, you know, the frequency of cleaning needed as well. Do you have a favorite air purifier? Um, so yes, I, there's, I have two favorites, um, and, and there, there are other great companies out there. So I don't mean to snub anybody, but you know, I, I only have limited time to vet everybody. Um, and so my two favorites are IntelliPure. Um, they make what's called the super V. I love the super V that's that Merv 16 filter we talked about for the HVAC. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's fantastic. It's probably one of the best things I've seen so far. Um, and then I, I actually really, really am interested in Molecule right now. Um, Molecule is a company that became really popular through the pandemic. Um, one of the interesting things about their filtration is they have what's called a Pico filter. And the reason that I like the Pico filter is two, two reasons. One, Pico filters have been shown to be antimicrobial, meaning mold's not going to grow on them. HEPA filters... We know that if we don't change them frequently and they get wet, mold will grow on them. I've seen all the the horror stories with that. Um, The other thing I like about Pico is I saw an independent study just recently how it can get down to 0.1 nanometers, which would basically be better than any HEPA filter we've ever owned. So, um, and this is an independent study that I did not obtain from Molecule just as a, you know, transparency. So when I started looking at like, all the technology in this Pico filtration, um, I'm pretty excited to see a lot more of that come out. It's, it's very new, right? It's only mm-hmm. a couple of years old. So uh, we need a little bit more time for things to, to kind of uh, understand all the different things that it can help with, but uh, it's, it seems very promising. And so Molecule was nice enough to send me two of them. Uh, I've been testing them and, you know, making sure that before I say anybody's name that it's responsible and people are going to benefit from it. But I think um, from, I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. So I'm, I'm highly interested to see how they continue to develop their company and create products that someone who, who is looking for a, a better environment scientifically can obtain that. Good to know. That's not either of the ones that I own. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, there's other great companies <laughs> out there. Um, you know, and I've seen some really great stuff, but you know, um, the, with, I don't like mentioning names when I say anything that could be considered negative. Of course, yeah. Some of, some of the filters out there that people like, especially um, some doctors and stuff, uh, the papers are very limited, meaning it's like one piece of paper that says, yes, we get this small. 
and they're talking about the filter and that they're basing it off a test where they cut that filter and put it in an HVAC machine. And I just, you know, I'd like to see a little more than that. I think it's a great start, but I'd like to see more. So hopefully these other companies start getting serious about, um, you know, doing some studies. I think yeah. studies are really important because it helps us understand in different circumstances how this may be a benefit. And it could be far beyond just the air purifier we're trying to sell. It could be the technology behind it. So I think it's, um, you know, I'm hoping to see some more stuff come out from other people. I think because air purification has such a uh, potential to have a profound impact for us um, from a health perspective and making sure that our air quality is good, um, I'd really love to see, you know, people getting into that industry, you know, taking it seriously. Okay. All right. Well, as we, as we wrap this up, I know a lot of people are going to ask like where we've, you've used the word remediation a lot. Can you just briefly explain what does remediation mean? And then if somebody's listening to this going, oh crap, I need to find a remediator or I had remediation. I think I probably need a second opinion or a second run through where it's still not right. How does somebody go about finding you, but in their state? Sure. Well, to answer your first question, um, we're going to talk, I'm going to say this in two, two ways. Again, um, there's what remediation used to be and what it needs to be. Um, and the, what it needs to be is something that I am, you know, desperately trying to pioneer, um, on a larger scale. And it's the, it's what I've been doing for the past 10 years. And that is basically making the necessary repairs and improvements to a home that's going to stop you know, prevent issues from happening. Um, obviously, you can't prevent everything because materials do degrade over time, um, but you can prevent the active issues, right? Uh, remove the living organisms, producing particles and toxins, reproducing rapidly, et cetera. And then removing those particles and toxins from our environment after. And you have to do it in that order, of course, otherwise you're spinning your wheels. Um, this is what remediation needs to be. This is what I practice. Um, what remediation is for some people and used to be, which is why remediation doesn't work, is basically just ripping out walls and removing mold, um, you know, and trying to kill it from that perspective. Uh, and that was kind of that old, old approach. It's like making, it makes it look like it never happened, but if you tested it scientifically, you're like, wow, that, you know, the bodies are all still there, right? So we have to look at it from that perspective because, um, you know, well, there's an evolution that needs to happen there, which is, is kind of what I am stressing to both consumers and the professional industry at large. So, um, yeah, that's in a nutshell. If you mm -hmm. want to look for me, uh, best thing to do would be to go to the moldmedic.com, um, where you can learn more about me, take a look at the book. I have tons of free resources on there. Um, I am developing a, uh, a little course as well to give people information. I'm trying to make this information as accessible as possible for people because otherwise we're never going to get where we need to go from a societal standpoint. And then if you need remediation, you should definitely check out homecleanse.com. We are nationwide. Uh, I know we're going to Alaska next week. We're very excited about, we go everywhere. We have locations in California, uh, in the New York city area, and then also uh, Tampa, Florida, but we also travel to everywhere else in between. Um, so if you need help and you need someone who's really going to do this from a medical-based perspective and a scientific-based perspective, this company that is everybody I've trained um, and they're fantastic. So you'd be in great hands. I love that. I love that. Well, given that this is the Root Cause Medicine podcast and we have been talking about mold in the home and remediation, what are the top like two or three practical and tactical things you want to leave everybody with. Cause you're so you, we talk about it and then you're like, there's a, there's a silver lining. There's this bright spot here. Let me help you. What are the top two or three? So, um, the top one thing is owning and maintaining a home can be overwhelming. Um, especially when things have spun out of control, you're not feeling well, and you're just trying to wrap it up. Um, you just take it one step at a time. And, you know, I think that's something that I, I preach to people because when I see scientific data, you know, you're going to have some mold here or there, you're going to have some issues here or there, but you're looking at like, what is really creating the most amount of impact? What's creating a ton of particulate that's affecting me. 
And you start there, right? We, we don't have money trees in our backyard. So you got to just take the steps you can take. So that when you look at it from that way, we know we're not trying to have a mold free home. We're just trying to have a better environment than we have the, the day before. We can take a bite sized approach to it. Um, and we take the steps that we need to take one step at a time and we continue to move on and improve. So that is one takeaway that I want people to have. The second takeaway that I want people to have is, and it's unfortunate, but you have to be your own advocate. And that is like anything in the world, you have to know, you have to educate yourself and become prepared to go out and do anything, whether you're going to a doctor, whether you're hiring an inspection company or remediation company, or you're taking your car to get some work done. If you don't know better, you're likely to find someone who also doesn't know better. And if they don't know better, they won't be able to help you because they don't actually know how. So I think it's really important that, you know, especially when, when it comes to an evolving science, uh, you want to educate yourself just enough to really understand how do I find what I'm looking for? The third thing that I, I want you, I want you to kind of think with is, you know, we talked about a lot. It's a lot of information. I, you know, I tend to overload on these things and, um, you know, you may need to listen back to this two or three times to get the full value out of it. But, you know, just remember, you know, health is holistic. This is a journey, right? Uh, it's going to take a bit of time. This is part of the problem for sure. Um, it's something that you can do. You can take different steps and approaches to it. I don't care if you own your home or rent. There are things that you can do to improve your environment that, you're, that you live in. And so I just want you to kind of remember that Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, take your time. Do it right. Um, do your research. Be your own advocate and get the information that you need to make that sound decision. And, you know, that's going to take away the overwhelm. It's going to take away the anxiety. Um, if anybody tells you that, you know, you got to do it all, or you're never going to get better. I think that, um, you know, maybe that was the old way of looking at things. You know, I think the new way of looking at things is the only way to help people is to really figure out how to take steps forward. And I think that's what it really comes down to. So, you know, I hope that, you know, you leave this conversation well more informed. Um, I hope uh, if you are dealing with some issues and you suspect that it could be your home, I hope you are, you know, feeling good in the fact that you can do this scientifically. You can take one step at a time as you should and get all the information and make a sound decision from there. And again, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can find these resources. Yes, uh, you can find me again at themoldmedic.com, uh, homecleanse.com as well for remediation. And, you know, buy this book. <laughs> the Mold <please>. Medic. <laughs> it's only... Yes. Uh, it's only a hundred and something pages. All right. It's not a b very big read. Um, I actually, uh, I tell a lot of stories in there, which is good to kind of understand some perspective, but I break down, you know, what mold is different terminology. I define it. So you don't have to, you know, go get out your microbiology dictionary to, to comprehend it. And um, it, it really, it, it really does a good job just kind of identifying the different steps that you need to take and some of the things you need to look out for. You know, it's only a hundred and, and, and something pages, so it's an easy read, but also it's only a hundred and something pages. So it's not going to tell you everything there is to know. Right. So, but if you, if you read it, you know, for the $8, I think that it is on an, on an ebook, I think you'll, you'll feel well more, uh, you'll feel the value out of it. And I think you'll get a lot of good information to kind of kickstart your journey and where, what do I do and how do I do it? And it's going to take away a lot of that anxiety and fear over, am I doing it right? Because you're going to have that, that little guidebook right there for you. And you're on Instagram with the same name, correct? The Mold Medic? Yes. I'm at the Mold Medic and I post a lot of funny TikTok style videos. If yes, you, he does. that's your thing. <laughs> you should follow him. You'll learn <laughs> a ton. Of course, also by the book. Well, wonderful. Michael, thank you so much for being on the Root Cause Medicine podcast. This has been so insightful. I just really appreciate you coming on today. Oh, thank you so much for having me and giving me this platform to educate others. And I hope a lot of people have learned from this.